In this video, I'd like to take you back to the start of the new millennium. Not the 41st millennium, not the 31st millennium, but the second millennium. In the year 2000, the third edition of Dungeons & Dragons was released. So today, on the 20th anniversary of the third edition of Dungeons & Dragons, I'd like to take you back and go through a little bit of my experiences, my nostalgia, and a bit of a review of the third edition of Dungeons & Dragons. While we're doing this, I'm going to be repainting one of the player character miniatures from my original D&D campaign as a gift for my best friend Jamie, who originally played this character. To first give you a little bit of context, I had a very large extended family growing up, with over a dozen aunts and uncles, and over 20 cousins. I didn't have a lot of friends at school, and a lot of my closest friends growing up were my sisters and my cousins. I was playing Magic the Gathering with a few of my cousins when my uncle came up to us and asked us what we were playing. He said that it reminded him of a game that he had played in the 70s called Dungeons and Dragons. I can remember reacting with confusion as he explained to us the concept of a game that didn't use a game board, any sort of cards, or any plugs or game controllers. A few weekends later, he arrived with a large black messenger bag that smelled like a musty basement, or possibly an old uncle. As he opened this bag, I can remember it was full of rule books, pieces of paper, and dice. He really wasn't kidding when he was saying that this game didn't have any sort of board or box or anything that it came in. He was very secretive about this bag, and I remember the only book inside that we were allowed to look at was this one, The Player's Handbook. Using this book and a few of the character sheets that he had photocopied, we spent the next two weekends all coming up with characters, and actually he made us come up with two characters each because he said that one of them might die. And he was right about that. I remember that my first character that I came up with was a halfling rogue, or as it was called in those days, a thief. When he tried to explain the game, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to us, but once we started playing, it became very obvious. It was very much just playing pretend, but with more rules, and I think if he had explained it that way, it would have made a lot more sense. The first adventure that he ran us through was Keep on the Borderlands, which I think is one of the classic adventures. I feel like that's one of the classics. It took us several weekends to get through a lot of it, and often he wasn't available, so sometimes it would be like one session a month, two sessions a month at most. So we didn't get to play too often, and eventually my uncle started coming around less and less, and it was harder to find the time to play. However, this all changed when one of my cousins showed up this all changed when one of my cousins showed up one weekend with this box. Like I was saying before, this wasn't just any summer, this was the summer of the launch of 3rd edition D&D. This box contained everything we would need to play Dungeons & Dragons without my uncle. I can remember this being quite exciting for us because 1st edition seemed like a very complex mathematical thing that only my uncle could understand and he would have to walk us through. Whereas this box explained to us everything we would need to do to run our own games. And this gave us all a sense, well, especially me, a sense of ownership of this new edition of the game, which I think is exactly what the marketing intended it to be. The box contained a set of dice, a map, some little tokens, which was pretty cool, and a bunch of pre-generated characters that we could play as. My favorite character to play as was Lydda, the halfling rogue. Rogues would definitely be the character class that I played the most over the next few years. While my cousin had bought this box, he had no real interest in being the one to run the games. So it often fell to me to be the dungeon master. And once I got up a little bit of confidence, I found that I really liked this idea, and I started to insert my own characters and scenarios into the pre-generated adventures. This would become sort of a pattern for me, and I would very rarely be a player character, and very often be the one running the game throughout the next decade of my life. Around that October, I would save up my allowance to buy my very own copy of the player's handbook, which was really all you needed to play the game. I remember wanting this book so badly, 
and being so happy when I finally purchased it from the nerd section of our local chapters bookstore. While the Dungeon Master's Guide and the Monster Manual were also released that fall, I didn't end up buying those additional books until a full year or so later, because I didn't have that kind of money, and they weren't really as necessary to play if you were mostly using pre-written adventures anyway. The artwork inside of these books was incredible, and it greatly influenced my own art style and the way I would draw things for years to come. More than anything else, the rules themselves were comprehensible. This edition was the advent of the D20 system, where whenever anyone wanted to do basically anything, they would just roll a D20, and then add a number based on whatever skill or ability they had. If the resulting number was higher than the difficulty number, then it would be a success, and if it was lower, it would be a failure. This seems like something that we take for granted in a lot of RPG systems these days, but this was a very new thing compared to older editions of D&D. Not only that, but this game also came with something called the OGL, or Open Gaming License, meaning that anyone could use the core D20 rule set to write their own games or supplements that would be compatible with 3rd edition D&D. Whether you were a fan of this idea or not, it caused a massive upheaval in the RPG industry. D&D was always the most popular RPG, and now everyone could write content for it. Tons of amazing companies that we don't even associate now with making RPGs, like Privateer Press, for example, got their start by making D20 products during this time. It was so much easier to sell your own RPG modules, campaign worlds, or other accessories when it was compatible with D&D. The downside was that the market became flooded with a ton of sort of subpar products as well, but personally, I think this was an overall good thing for the market. As me and my cousins eventually grew up and I didn't spend as much time at my grandfather's house, I would make a few friends at my high school and we would have our own little games of Dungeons and Dragons. As it was high school and almost no one wanted to commit to a weekly schedule of playing something like this. The games often didn't last more than a few sessions each, but I do still have a lot of fond memories of those games. It was in my college years when I really had the creativity, the friends, and the extra time and space to run long-running campaigns. <laughs> From the years of 2004 to 2010, I ran a long-running campaign, which was probably over 60 sessions, and we split it into four seasons, like a TV show. It even had a very short spin-off show with a second set of players. Me and my friends were so into this world that we had our own website with a wiki, uh, which contained all sorts of short fiction that all of us wrote as well as our own fan art. Me and my friend Jamie even eventually wrote a short novel set in this universe. One of the things I am most nostalgic for in my life is for this long running game. It was one of the most important things to me during that period in my life, and I met some of my closest friends. It was just generally something that I really looked forward to and had a lot of passion for. One of the greatest regrets in my life is that I became distracted by a lot of other things in my early 20s and was never able to give this game a proper ending. I played in and run a few other role-playing games since that time, but none of them were quite as magical or as important to me as 3rd edition D&D and the memories that that game made for me. And in many ways, I have that game to thank for where I am today. It was the reason that I started painting miniatures and the reason that I started to take hobbies like this more seriously in general. I hope you enjoyed this little time capsule and this look into my backstory. If you'd like to see more videos where I paint Dungeons & Dragons figures, or talk more about different role-playing games, please let me know down in the comments. If you would not like that and you want me to only talk about Warhammer all the time, feel free to put your comments in the garbage. Before we go, I'd like to thank every, every one of my patrons for supporting me so generously and allowing me to do this full time as a job. I would especially like to thank Perscu Percussive Scruff, Zerkist, Stuart Smith, Jonathan Rhodes, Laurel, and Alex Brock. Thank you so much for your support. I wouldn't be able to do this without you. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram at Dana underscore Howell if you'd like to see my daily painting updates. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next week.
there's something moving behind that door. Perhaps it's a vicious ogre waiting to tear you limb from limb. Or a horde of zombies thirsting for blood. Or maybe a terrifying dragon ready to engulf you in a maelstrom of fire. Problem? No, nope. not for you. You're a hero, a powerful wizard, a strong fighter, or a sneaky rogue. You can handle whatever comes at you in this introduction to the greatest fantasy game of all time. Everything you need to start playing is right here. <laughs>